I've been thinking now all of a sudden this class maybe is now of course because let's pretend that my teaching is actually connected which I think is dangerous when you do this but as you know we taught I taught a we we did a class on I mean you can't teach about the things that my class has been about so I I kind of want to use the word teach um but remember a couple of weeks ago we talked about the sensation of eternity right and that of the the human capacity for for um our inability to actually our mind's limitation to be able to hear and grasp the sensation of expansive time. So you're about to get a review to understand this third class for people that are new to this class, right? So that, that human beings, our minds don't do it well. We have numbers, numbers get us there. So like I know the universe is 13.8 billion years old, right? But my mind can't really grasp that. And not really. Our consumption of plastic doesn't really grasp that this is here for six million years, right? We just kind of let that gap be utilized, right? Like literally we suck it. We suck it even now in this country with like the way business operates. They're operating on quarter to quarter profits. We're accelerating the sensation of time, right? Like so five-year plans are unheard of. Three-year plans are great, right? So like our aware, our mind will try to squeeze time and speed it up, right? So in that first class, I talked about a line from the a Louise Erdrich book that I've been thinking about for a couple of years. It was in the Night Watchman, I think it was a couple of years ago, about her, one of the characters having a quick, one of the native characters having a quick criticism of, white culture being that they are so disconnected from the sensation of eternity that that they are accelerating time and part of the reason why native americans try one of the benefits they get from being more connected to the earth is that the earth is the oldest object we're ever coming in contact with so by being more connected through beauty and through rit rit ritual to the earth they're actually getting the sensation of eternity to be a constant and consistent aspect of their daily lives. And that that's something that from their perspective, that white culture in particular deeply lacks, especially in the United States. And so the other thought that is coming together as threads and what's gonna be the third class, which hopefully I'll be done with this step up, um this step into like the abyss a little bit um is that <clears throat> one of the reasons why we're not so good at time we're and or of other dimensions right um is that we're clearly three dimension beings and i want to talk a little bit in the second class i talked a little bit about how we're kind of three and a half dimensional beings we're kind of four dimensional because our relationship to time is a little bit more but we definitely have you know um by the way, did you know that the Cartesian grid that we all grew up with was a, wasn't invented until Descartes did it? So that was a huge breakthrough for mathematics, just an X and Y axis. Like, what the hell? It's a huge breakthrough. We didn't even have, they didn't have one. They weren't plotting in dimensional space, even two dimensional space, right? Um, but we're three dimensional beings because we have, X, Y axis and depth, right? And that, by the way, a three-dimensional realization is already realized by our body. And our mind tends to want to make everything two-dimensional, right? That's how the mind stays grounded, is to actually make more things more two-dimensional. Because has anyone noticed that three-dimensional space without being able to see it and control it is why being in the dark is a little bit scary, right? Three-dimensional space is hard for the mind to deal with. So someone that's been traumatized with like PTSD is having trouble with three-dimensional space. 
because mortal threats come at them from unexpected directions, right? And they don't know how to be in three-dimensional space. Their mind, their brain has now been triggered to release too many hormones and too much of a response in three-dimensional space, right? The sensation of it on their skin, skin, right? Makes them, their mind freak out in three-dimensional space because the mind is gonna make everything two-dimensional to control it, right? So one of the weird, so I'm trying to review everyone that hasn't been on these classes and I think it's even good for me to try to say it again because I'm gonna to try to teach a class a little bit more in the future, right? So, so for those of you that just come into this class, good luck to you, right? So, um, so um, if we're clearly three-dimensional beings and we're kind of, and the sensation of expansive time, we're kind of tapped to that a little bit more. So I'd say we're three and a half dimensional beings. And, and one, of the, one of the reasons I think that why we're kind of in fourth dimension too is because we have memory, right? And we can plan about the future. Like we have a relationship that's a little bit deeper to time, right? a little bit more expansive than two dimensions, but not fully three dimensional. And part of the reason why, why I think that it, we would have three, we'd have full, we'd be fully four dimensional beings if we could travel through time forward and backward and change it. We don't have any causal connection to the past. We have imprints of the past. So the second class started off by saying the question of time travel is actually is actually more settled. Um, it's already settled. It's whether human beings can appreciate the acts, our particular version of time travel, right? Like, and getting the most out of it. The fact that we can plan about the future and we can feel the past. And so like part of the thing that this culture in the, in the United States for reasons of our shame, basically, <laughs> that we're having a hard time with allowing that there's generational trauma and there's generational history that we 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 have to be accountable for or some have some relationship to it is people don't we're uncomfortable with the fact that we can't be causal agents to fix it it's not exactly sure how to be causal agents to fix it going forward right there aren't there aren't great answers so we're like this isn't just an abstract issue this is an issue that we have to reconcile right is how to have an acknowledgement of the past and not feel shame about what's been before or feel guilty or or whatever but don't have the, are wanting to deny the expansiveness of time like not have not have that the fact that we can't go back and change it actually make us not take in the truth that we time travel that human consciousness has an imprint from the past that affect the present, which affect the future, right? So what, time travel's already happened. So it's not that it's not some space trippy thing, right? It's actually true. We're three and a half dimensional beings. So here's one more weird thought before I try to actually introduce the, in the second class, in the first class, I also said, one of the reasons why maybe human being isn't so good at feeling expansive time and I tried to say this, that it's so interesting to me. And I love the fact that we, I, I, I think this is something human beings need to get better at, which is, which is um, we got to get better at experiencing vast time, right? And, and, and because I think it deepens our consciousness. And that's why we like to go to museums and see ruins and see when you can go to a place that has the sensation of where, where the where time especially pastime can become a sensation without it feeling horrible, it deepens our awareness and we value it. Like there's a reason why diamonds, because they're both rare and they take like millions of years to form are so valuable, right? Why antiques, we pay exorbitant money for antiques. We know this, we try to monetize it, that time, is actually, if it doesn't just wear you out, it's incredibly valuable, right? So human beings kind of know this, but we try to monetize it. 
which is an interesting expression of appreciation, right? But one of the problems with our mind, remember, I'm saying that our relationship to time travel is limited by our mind. If we try to grasp it with our minds, we, we force it into two dimensions, right? And so one of the ideas, so it's not just that there are four dimensions, by the way, there's like, they think quantum physics is coming up with maybe there's 11 dimensions and like that's where maybe dark matter is and all that, you know, all the stuff we are hearing about as words, but, you know, and there's ether and then there's people. And one of the things I want to say is our autonomic nervous system senses more of the dimensions that our minds can grasp or ever perceive, but we can sense it. One of the reasons why I've been working with trauma so deeply and with and getting some traction talking to people, neuroscientists and psychologists like Bessel van der Kolk and Ruth Lanius is because, because I think that one of the things that's very curious about the injury of trauma is it can, I think our, our autonomic nervous system is more connected to more dimensions, right? So what you're seeing is an injury that's affecting our dimensional awareness and the mind is freaking out trying to that's what high hypervigilance is and weird relationships is the mind gets freaked out when you can get injured at the very source of how you're plugged into the universe so really bad trauma actually actually hurts you right where we plug into the universe that's why I've been studying it, because I'm very curious about that, right? And I just think we're not thinking about it right. Like, we're not getting. And one of the reasons what I've been trying to convince, and, and psychology is coming to this point, but is that one of the ways that yoga in particular can help trauma and, and, um, and, um, an injury like this is that by helping a, a person reclaim the sensation of space in their body, they're actually touching past time because the body has been in your whole life. Your mind hasn't. And that you can reclaim empowerment and a whole bunch of things, not because of what you can do with your muscles, but because the body also carries your time, right? On all the levels, because it's the three-dimensional witness of your life. Your mind goes in and out of phase, right? I'm sorry for the people. I hope this is, I'm trying to get, I'm going to try to get the future here pretty quick. But it, so one of the things, getting back to the first class, that when physics are trying to think about all the dimensions, here's their thought experiment about what it would be like for us. Imagine the fifth dimension or whatever dimensions, which by the way, in our language, we have mediums, we have people that channel things, we have people that write music from all different places. We all sense that there's more here. We even create belief systems of God and all these other things because we know there's something else going on here, right? And our, we know we feel it at our core. It's in our language, right? So we are we are trying to articulate something that we can't perceive, right? So if there were more dimensions, like a fifth dimension, they say, imagine we're two dimensional beings, right? We lived in a flat surface, and the three dimensional being came into our orbit although there's so there's more dimension but we're two-dimensional and that would they would their presence in our space would be flat right so we would we would experience a three-dimensional being as a shadow in a flat plane okay so what i was trying to say in the first class is that's how eternity is going to come to us is that it's going to be an intangible experience that we can't directly ex we can't directly um that we can't directly perceive it would come through us as a sensation like a bird flying overhead and casting a shadow 
And it turns out that it's a sensation that we can actually time expansion. We can experience in centering. Our autonomic nervous system, when it calms down, when you activate the parasympathetic nervous system and, and the rest of it, like we can actually feel it. And there've been other cultures that are better at experience in eternity than we are. Because we're all about causality in the West. We're all about control and, and making the space into power, right? And there are ways that we can feel it. So when I try to say, so when you think you're just centering at the beginning of class, you're not. You're the two-dimensional being touching the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, and eleventh dimension but you only get to perceive it. Your mind only gets to perceive it, right? That way, as a shadow. But when you can make the sensation of time, expansive time, a, when you can make time feel as a sensation, the way the Grand Canyon does, the way it, a, 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 a redwood, makes me feel these are the places where i can feel expansive time you have them too when it can become a three-dimensional sensation right then i'm actually touching way more than i know remember i've been telling you about yoga poses there's more happening than you know i can't teach you what you don't know what you don't know is still happening what's happening might be more profound than what you know I think centering and meditation and that limb of yoga as a precursor to movement is actually touching way more than we know, right? And we can, this same space in the body. So the yogis are telling you to quiet your mind down because then unity appears and the little self merges with the big self, right? Because the mind's limits stops the realization because the mind's gonna try to make things into objects and the other dimensions are never gonna be objects and they're never gonna be causal. They're gonna change us. They're not going to tell us what to do. They change how life comes through us, how prana flows. So there's a lot happening in your yoga poses, right? Just don't think it makes you right, right? Don't try to turn it into power, right? So now, finally, after a 20-minute recap, does anyone feel uncertainty when they think about the future? What's the best way to, uh, one of my favorite jokes that's not a joke, it makes me laugh. What's the best way to make God laugh? Tell him all your plans, right? The older you get, the more you know that you know, like in a successful business, right? They make a business, a, mi a mission statement, they get some core values, they set a plan, they execute the plan, they make a lot of money. That's the hope. So planning actually, our ability to like, step into the future and execute plans is part of the giving us tremendous amount of power or control over the environment. It's, and what we end up believing if you need any proof about the importance of uh, accepting that there's a truth here, but the power of human belief and what it does when it goes awry, look at the last three years in this country, right? Like we got to, when you start to say, no, what I, what I, what I want to believe is what's true. When that collapses, things collapse. It might take down democracy in this country. We will see, right? So, but we can plan. So we can step into the future, but the future has a whole bunch of uncertainty. So the same centering 
that maybe gets us access to expansive time is the same centering that allows us to deal with the uncertainty of the future. Right? So sit up straight and tall. Right? <clears throat> Start to feel more rather than less. What I love about asana is not only in why I will never just be a meditator, is that this realization of expansive time, the ability to go in the future, the fact that there may be other dimensions, right? I get to feel and then bring the movement. If I can take that other, those other dimensions and channel it through movement, it's gonna change me, right? So start to feel more rather than less. So we have interoception and proprioception and all this stuff. So feel your feet on the floor, on the ground, in your sitting bones. And the idea of making space in your body is not just to calm down your mind. It's to plug you in. Because your mind will, its job, its job is to narrow the world so you don't freak out, right? There's so much freaking happening here. The mind is the great contraction. When you center, you get to touch more. Turns out your skin one grounded and connected to the bone, so feet on the floor, sitting bones. When you hit down and start to gently rise up without using too much will, you start using too much will and you'll lose the connection to dimension, right? Your will actually flattens the world, but makes you an agent, right? That sensation of space, soften your jaw, the inside of the mouth or in your temples, has all of your time in it. Because, have you ever noticed that like, when you worry and think about the future, you tend to clench your jaw? You actually contract? Because the mind doesn't fucking know how to have it. So the yogis tell you, stop your mind. So it turns out that grounded and space and the skin keeps you connected to the outer world. So when I tell you to balance in the whole room, open to what's behind you, I'm exactly telling you to open what your mind can't see. I try to tell you the space around you is benevolent. It didn't do the violence. I tell I try to tell you it like the world did, humans did. The car that bounced over my chest did the violence. It wasn't the space around me. And I have to get my mind to ungrip, to feel my whole potential. My whole depend the potential is in all 11 dimensions. My mind is in two dimensions. My body's in three dimensions. And together I touch more time in four dimensions. So just for a second, I'm finally going to shut up and let it all be true. Let it be true. Grounded, expanded space. Put eyes on the inside of your body and on the outside of your skin. Balance the eyes that look both inward and outward.
believe in your spine. And the center of your chest connects to everything. Let go of your day. Prepare your mind to do yoga. And then release. Take your sternum up towards your chin. Your chin down over your sternum. People that know more than us believe this position is really important for your spine. Try to give all bunch of different descriptions to you as to why. I think maybe that might be the case. I can tell when I do it, it grounds my sitting bones. I can tell that my rib cage, which are the fingers of my spine, can touch my breath with more discipline. The movement of the breath, the inhalation, touches my spine if I let it, if I learn how to make it supple. The pause shows me non-being and the ceasing. The exhalation washes it all through me. And as I exhale, I lengthen my spine into action. And then it gets to start again, but I need not to pass by the quietness at the bottom of the exhalation. I need to learn how to be with the uncertainty of retention and then start the movement of life again. So I study asana. I love the movement. I love that wa things wash in and out of here. And then the exhaling. So there's an expansion on inhalation and the energy that you take or you, get, or you receive, actually can lengthen your spine on exhalation. But, and I don't want you to lengthen the retention on both ends, but I want you to know that's in your spine too. That's part of the shadow of dimension. It's in the retention. And then start the process again. I'll bet you you're pressing the, your tongue against the roof of your mouth. I'll bet you as you're trying to hear all this, your mind is gripping your dimension. Loosen up again. I think the chin is dropped to keep the mind humble. It relinquishes its control to the fire that's coming up through your spine. And now I'll bet you this position, you're having a harder time feeling your skin touch the space in the room. All these things are happening. And then raise your head up with closed eyes and open your eyes. I can tell you, I struggle with paralysis and, and the abdominal paralysis and my fusion in my back to do the lift in the chest and the, and sustain it and the drop in the chin, right? So, but if I focus on doing it right, which this body can't do it the way that a lot of other bodies can, right? Then I lose the point of what I'm learning, right? It was if I could see what it was doing. I can do that even if I can't do the pose all the way. The other thing I like, so sit up straight and tell, when I get into really centering, aren't you? I get so happy. I, I'm always happy to be done with centering, right? Because, and, and I like, so sit up and get really quiet again. 
it just makes me burst out with happy laughter and joy that human beings have figured out rhythm. Right? Because in this place that I'm scared of and uncertain of, that has so much dimension, it overwhelms my mind. We can move with the space in rhythm. So find some rhythm right now. It's one of the best human innovations. And that somebody figured out how to make it out of wooden strings, blow into stuff. Like, what the hell? I'm so happy about music. Like, holy cow. Right? And, and then these things start to, like, I'm so glad that somehow it's, and when there's sound waves coming at me in different patterns and rhythms, some of me can move with it. And when I start to do this and start to move, take, you know, start to do the, the kind of the stretching we do every time, when I start to do all that, right, and then come forward, I'm going to lift up, remember, some of the space that I think is actually crucial is the space in the lower part of your spine, right? Especially if you sit a lot in a wheelchair. So that space, the, the and this is where, because we're becoming more sedentary, people having a lot of low back problems as we age, right? It's because we're compressing, like clenching your jaw, your this is the top of your spine. So when you clench your jaw, you're actually constricting your dimension. But there it turns out that the lower part of your back is also a really too bad a way <laughs> of, of basically clenching your jaw, right? And hardening the inside of your mouth. So get that sense of buoyancy. And remember, given what I tried to just lay out, right? This buoyancy contains all of your life that you get to choose when you go in and out of, right? That's what I was trying to say about your yoga practice is if you got a good enough practice, you don't have to time travel all the time. You only want to time travel once in a while. And last week I was telling you about the time travel. I've been going back to my accident scene. It's been really freaking hard, right? So now I want to take up more space. I've been trying to get myself out of a survival loop that that boy in, in the grassy median, my mind has been trying to take care of me ever since, right? So now I'm spreading my legs. I don't know if you can quite see it, but I'm spreading my legs because I want to get my groins open because I want the base of my spine to start to receive better. So I'm, I'm, bro I'm, I'm trying to get, because we all tighten our groins as, as a thing of stress, right? Everybody, right? And so getting your groins more open, it's not about the flexibility, it's about tilling the soil at the base of your spine. So now leaning over to the right, and we know we do this every week. So I'm leaning over, so I'm doing the beginning of a standing pose, right? But what's important about how we're doing it when you're warming up, see, I should try to lower the screen so you can see, and I've said this to you before, but what I'm trying to get you to get is when you're warming up, you want to prepare your spine, right? <clears throat> you want to prepare your spine to receive. And basically, that's kind of what yoga and asana is. So you're taking your legs wide. And, and what I'm trying to get you is like, I've done this before, where I want you to both take your knees wide and lift your chest and do it in rhythm. Right, so this becomes a yoga pose. You can do it like throw it away like it doesn't matter. Or you can do it like you're making something coordinated happen. Doesn't really matter if your legs are wide. If you can't take your legs wide, you gotta feel your sitting bones and truly surrender between your sitting bones. Because your core channel is looking for expression out through the limbs. So what I'm doing here is getting this part of my spine a more open groin, changing gravity, 
and moving my knees at the same time, right? So I'm actually integrating different parts of my spine right now, just in this simple movement, right? And I'm using rhythm, I'm using expansion, and I'm creating the sense of space, right? So I wanna jump a little bit because I wanna remember to be freaking happy, right? So I wanna like get some movement, right? And, and people, you know, traditional students are actually, so traditional students are getting this all in standing poses, right? And we, it's harder when you're in a chair. So when I was shifting gravity again, I was doing and pushing like this, right? I was doing an expansion of my spine, an integration of my chest into the pose, a grounding down on my forearm, a push down on the back leg, getting a sensation of separation between my spine and my legs, which is coming to most people in standing poses, so traditional students. And I'm getting all this in play, right? And then I'm gonna go to the other side. And so I'm gonna go up. And for those of you that are more traditional students, on this call, you can hear all the standing poses happening. You can see the variations, what they're all after. They're after an expression of your spine, an integration of different parts of your spine with the expression out through your limbs, right? And so we're trying to get the core of that, right? Now, all of this can also happen when you're, when you're not in expanding your space so you can do, bring your legs together remember tadasana right remember your midline so i like to bring my knees in together so i remember because my mind's gonna think it's about doing the other part so good right i want to remember and i'm gonna like take one arm up Right, so I'm gonna to start to come back to more simple poses because we'll do more complex poses in a second, right? <clears throat> so I'm gonna take one arm up, one arm down, right? I'm gonna hit down, rise up, and now I'm gonna to try to figure out how to integrate my breath once I'm there. So when I take the inhalation at first, I tend to lose the grounding in my sitting bones, right? So I'm gonna do the other side because I'm an equal opportunity yogi. Right, I better get both sides, right? But now this time on this one, when I inhale, I'm gonna coordinate, use the inhale to lift my arm. Exhale, lengthen my spine up through my fingertips. So remember on exhale, when you come back to the midline after the expansion, right? You're lengthening, come back down, do it on the other side. So now I'm making this, I'm trying to auger the earth. I'm channeling the earth here when I actually bring the precision in and then come down. So if I'm a two-dimensional being, I wanna like make my two dimensions receive as much as possible. And that's what awesome is, right? All right, so whatever dimensions we have access to, we gotta teach them to receive. So now I'm making sure. So now come back down again, same side. So now on this one, I want you to like use the inhale to expand, but notice it's gonna pull you off your base a little bit. You try to keep your sitting bones down. So hit down through your sitting bones, inner groin to inner knee to inner heel. Use the, so get that, and notice you're gonna get that chronic connection with your breath tented, right? You're gonna get a different access to the prana in retention. You want both, right? And so I'm gonna use the expansion of the inhalation to make my arm lighter. Inhale up. I have to speak so I don't get to inhale up. So now if I drop my shoulder blade down, hit my sitting bone up, drop my sitting bone to get the prana to go beyond my fingertips. Where's my midline? Where are the different parts of my spine? Good, and then release. I could talk all day from right here, right? Inhale, now I'm gonna do the other side. I'm getting the grounding. I'm making the connection down. I'm doing that more on retention than on inhalation. 
I'm inhaling up. I'm exhaling my shoulder blade down, lengthening from my sitting bones to be on my fingertips, right? And then I'm gonna use my breath the whole cycle now to feed what's happening. The inhalation, the exhalation, and both your tensions. And then down. Wait, could all that really be happening? Yeah. Thank God yoga simplifies. Yet asana, you get to do all this without having to be aware of it because we're two-dimensional beings or we're three-dimensional beings that can't go to more dimensions, but we need to receive all the dimensions. I'm taking my legs away again. Right, so now I'm gonna add some more complexity. I'm gonna go over to one side. So I'm in a, I'm off to one side. I, remember I'm integrating different parts of my spine. It's all about the spine, stupid, right? Right, and so I'm over and now I'm gonna add. So on the inhalation, I'm gonna find the grounding. Remember we're, as we're using retention and space at the same time, emptying this into space, we're touching more dimensions, right? Not everything has to be emotional. What I love about asana, I'm, I'm keeping here for a while, is I want you to keep refining your pose. What's great about asana is that I get to practice this without having to do all the emotional work all the time. Right, take your arm up. Now, Take your arm back down. And if you can't get your arm up, just do it with your elbow, right? So I want to now, I got to start this again because I just sucked that up. I'm going to go over again. I'm going to hit my forearm down into my leg. I'm going to make sure this part of my spine is going to enter the pose. I'm going to do that by grounding the underneath shoulder blade, right? And to make sure it touches the earth through my spine, right? Now, so remember, you're chronically connecting one retention moment with your mind, and then inhale up. Exhale, back the shoulder blade down. Now take your arm, keep your arm up. Exhale the shoulder blade down, I'm trying to show you. Exhale to the midline as you extend into the world. Good, and then release. Remember, my sense of time has been injured by in, in trauma, right? This class, I don't want to be as much about the past as, as I do this and ground my energy. I'm leaning this way, right? You're doing all the stuff. You're combining different parts of your spine, right? You're getting it like, taking time, that expression into the world is what it is to go to the future, right? So now I'm gonna, I'm gonna get this, get the grounding, inhale the expansion, exhale the grounding, beyond your fingertips, down to your sitting bones, down to the earth. And I'm thinking, I got this because there's uncertainty in the future, right? Good, and then come down because no matter what kind of plans you make for the future, they're uncertain. So I need to get better at allowing the sensation of eternity in order to be okay with the future, right? So I'm gonna go the other way again. I'm gonna ground under, I'm gonna stay connected. I want this to be my spine and not my arm. And I make, when I make it my spine, my legs enter the pose. I can tell you that my bottom shoulder blade is not doing the work of preserving my energy. 
I had a roll in there. Good, and then come back to center. I think we owe one more side to equal opportunity. Yogi. So I'm coming over again. And I'm rocking. Because in order to be happy, I need some rhythm. I need it from my core through my limbs. Lengthen my spine, open on inhalation, ground on exhalation, reach into the world beyond your fingertips. Do it by grounding to your midline. There's uncertainty here. Good, and then release. And I kind of think, then you know, wait, do we owe another side again? I'm getting confused. I started this side. No, we're good. <clears throat> Our uncertainty about the future is going to be helped by grounding and set the legs back together. It's going to be helped <clears throat> by getting better at receiving the sensation of eternity. How's that for a line? They're the same energy. All right. Downward facing dog. All this freaking talk. For me, I didn't realize what was happening because the asana looks like it's about, like it's really. Um, about doing the pose well, right? No, it's about way more than that. So I'm making sure my hands are gone. I got my hands on the table now. If you have it on your lap, that's fine too, right? right. You can go and do it this way. But I want to make sure Remember, I want length in your low back because space in your low back is like matters, right? So I'm trying to make sure the palms of my hands are grounded. Remember, I taught a part of the class I taught was about how dog pose and the way you work your arms can bring energy to your legs. Now, if I were to keep that simple, I'd say work the underside of your arms by grounding the inner edge of your shoulder blades. Hit down through your sitting bones, come up through your core, right? But then release and hit down through your sitting bones, right? But you're trying to expand beyond your palms, beyond your fingers to actually touch your feet. Now allow for the space in the room, right? You are more in control of the future than you think if you can stay grounded. Good, and then release. When your plans fail to execute the way you expect it, then um, if you're grounded, it's not gonna bug you as much, <laughs> right? You can know that the plans themselves were folly. Inhale, lift up. So the relationship to uncertainty, and then take the arm behind you, and the relationship to past time, future time, and the sensation of expansion of time are going to help you with the future. So I'm inhaling, lift up, I'm exhaling, I'm all the way in. All right. And then I'm going to let myself fall out of it. And I'm going to do it just by dropping my chest. And watch how dull that feels. And in this next there's a twist on the same side, I'm going to make sure different parts of my spine are directly activating and receiving in the pose. So I'm going to find my sitting bones. As soon as I do, my chest starts to lift. 
I'm going to catch it by dropping and broadening the space to my shoulder blades and we're spreading it. And then my spine is going to twist my pose. Inhale, lift up, exhale, over. And then I'm back to center. I drop, not back to center. I just want you to drop, right? So I, don't want to, I want you to watch. So now we're adding the dynamics, the dynamic, dynamic energy of the twist into the core channel, right? So I'm going to, again, find the sitting. Remember, you're trying to bring your access to prana that doesn't include breath into breath. So on kind of not by, don't hold your breath, but find your sitting bones in your feet. Because remember, prana follows conscious more than it follows breath, right? So I'm going to find that. I'm going to hit my sitting bones. I'm going to start to, so I'm getting the, as I hit my sitting bones down, I'm trying to open to the space between my sitting bones. I'm going to catch it with the center of my chest. Center of the chest is going to show me to drop my shoulder blades and broaden it. I'm going to inhale and lift up using the breath and the expansion. Then I'm going to exhale and go farther. But I want the bottom of my spine, the center of my chest, and my mouth, the top of my spine, to stay soft. So the dynamic energy is being realized in more dimensions, even though I'm in three dimensions. Good, and then release. So if you remember last week, I was talking about grief and about the fact that twists help grief because it, it twists, it adds dynamic energy through our empty spaces. So inhale, lift up. Right. And so I'm, oh, I'm doing all the things to feel space over. I'm making sure my spine's getting part of the pose. Right? So I do it three times on this side, right? So remember, I want you to find this, where don't twist too much yet, right? Find the sitting bones, find the chest. So you're trying to get the space between your sitting bones to nourish the space in your chest, right? and start to inhale, lift up, creating the, use the breath to create more space because space has got your dimension, right? And then exhale and really gracefully use your will. And then remember, I want you to drop your chest and break the pose, right? And release a little bit, give yourself a break. And then come back into it and activate. Keeping the space between your shoulder blades open, the grounding down, the expansion up, and then release. And make this be rhythmic the third time. Come on up. Right? You get rhythm here, too. Good. And then come on back to center. I'm not sure. And then I'm going to lift up a little bit because I, like, over-twisted there a little bit. I'm not sure, but somehow rhythms transcend it. Somehow rhythm touches more dimensions, right? Because <clears throat> I think probably what I'm receiving from the universe is coming in waves, right? And vibrations and all these things. So I think that twisting somehow is, and, and rhythm is a way for your, your mind to calm down. And then come back into dog pose. So your mind to calm down. <clears throat> so sometimes I practice. I'm leaning forward on my forearms here. So I'm actually doing <clears throat> preparation for headstand because why not? Right? Right? So, and even if you just, you know, if you can lean forward, you can do this on your legs, you can do it on your legs, right? Even, so when I'm doing it on my legs, right? I'm still creating a grounded base, like so my thigh bones are becoming the floor, right? And then in some ways that's even better, right? Than doing it on the table. In fact, now I kind of want to do it on the freaking on my legs. <laughs> Cause I, that just felt really good, right? So, but I'm bringing my fingertips to get my fingers together. And if you can't do this, just come towards the midline with your hands, right? <clears throat> 
So I'm doing it through the webs of my fingers. Uh, I taught a whole class on this, right? Be remember, right? So ground down your wrists, broaden your forearms, and as you hit down, lift your sternum. Find your sitting pose. Extend from the inner groin to the inner knee. We're quickly visiting headstand here. And then release. When my spine drops out of the pose, right? I'm not in the pose anymore. And if I try to do the pose from here with my spine not engaged, my muscles will overwork and I'll get injured. I just love that people are so attached to the outside of the pose. It's just the stupidest thing I've ever seen. It's unbelievable to watch people be attached to the outside of their poses. Come again, try it again. Make it all happen, fingers together, shoulder blades drop, forearms down, right? So the fingers come together, the midline activates. The forearms go down, you can start to feel the rise up. You broaden the, the wrists down, broaden across the forearms and your chest lifts. Use all that energy to ground down through your legs. That's headstand. Right? You just have to be upside down in, in traditional headstand. Good, and then release. Oh, what the hell? Now, sometime do that way. If there was more time, I didn't talk so damn much in this class. Right? I would have you do that again. But remember, you already could do all the mo movements. You just didn't realize what was happening. I can tell you after 32 years, I'm just beginning to realize what's happening in asana. Hopefully you can accelerate. This is the realization that took me 32 years. Okay. So quick little shoulder stand, right? Grab behind you. And Alan has the cat come right in front of the screen. The cat saying, you're supposed to be done at 11, right? So now I'm, here's my spine not participating. Here's my spine opening. Now I'm going to drop my chin, shoulder stand. Now I'm going to hit down to my center, down my inner groin. In this pose, in the nourishment of shoulder stand, I'm going to trust the earth. Good, and then release. Gently now. Back bend over the back of your chair. Wait, what if you did it with rhythm? Joy. And then come forward right onto your forearms and your thighs. It gets to go both in and out, right? So you're forward here and you're going more inward toward a forward bend. Find your spine, the bottom, the chest and the mouth. Good, and then go back again. Open your spine skyward to the world out this way. And then forward. Feet, forearms on your legs, sitting bones, chest. Symmetry. Prepare the symmetry as a way to receive Shavasana. The place where the mind is the biggest limit. Good, and then release. Find a comfortable position.
there's the receiving that you don't have to hold up the world and letting that be through your whole body is really hard. My mind sucks at it. So I have to like take some time, right? To let the chair hold me up. So it's gonna get better at it at first if I soften the inside of my mouth or on the temples and my jaw, the skin on my face. And then the joints, the space in the joints don't just release, gotta help them hover. Can you let the ankles hover at the same time as your knees? Same time as your wrists, your shoulders, your elbows, your hips. So the thing when you're sitting that you missed in Shavasana is that your back is forced into a receiving position through gravity. The hum without my mind is the gift of Shavasana. Feel your breath. Don't change it. Thank your body. It guarantees dimensional access way more than your mind does. The mind, in order to have any causality at all requires your body thank it it teaches you things that your mind will never see thank it again Your body doesn't do what you like. In some ways that makes it a better teacher. Start to bring yourself back, slightly deeper inhalation. 
I'm so glad that inhalation makes me feel my skin more. I'm so glad that exhalation makes me feel my spine more. So as you increase your breath, I'm so glad that living in the world is so incredibly sensual. When you're ready, you can open your eyes and let the light in. And if you hadn't had them open already, close your eyes and then let the light in and let it actually make your chest smile. And then close them again. And then open. And I don't know about you, but I was, that whole time, I was doing something really gentle with my fingertips. So I could keep touching stuff. Right? Coming out of Shavasana, I often like to touch stuff as I come back to the world more. Right? Bring in my spine to get ready for Namaste. Right? So here I come back before we end class. Right? All right, hands together. Namaste. Spirit in me, but as the spirit in you.